DataVant is fostering an ecosystem of healthcare data to facilitate secure exchange of information and analytics that improve patient care. The company recently made headlines through a $7 billion merger with Ciox, uniting DataVant's world of de-identified data with Ciox's domain expertise in patient identified records. In this episode of the Health Biz Podcast, DataVant's Chief Strategy Officer, Jason Labonte, and Chief Operating Officer, Bob Borek, discuss the evolution of healthcare data, the Ciox merger, how the company has fared during the pandemic, and their long-term vision for the industry. Jason is reading Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, whose fiction appeals to Jason's training as a PhD scientist, and Bob likes Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner about the history of water rights in the West. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps healthcare and life sciences companies like DataVant develop robust growth plans. Reach out to me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com, if you'd like to discuss strategy for your company. Well, Bob and Jason from DataBant, thanks for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks, Adam. Great to be here. You know, before we started rolling the uh, the tape, I warned you there's like a little bit of a therapy session here at the at the beginning, which is just to understand so people can know like who, who are we dealing with. So uh, I usually like to ask about kind of your, your upbringing, any childhood influences or education. So this could be like kind of compare and contrast. So maybe Bob, I'll let you go first. Yeah, this is great. I always do therapy. Totally like well. I uh, so I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, went to high school there before leaving for college. Um, from a career perspective, have been sort of all over the place. Uh, at, at one point in time, thought I was going to be an English professor. Uh, ended up uh, going to law school, practiced restructuring and finance law for a while then move into a hedge fund and then managing operations at a biopharmaceutical company uh, before I come into data mat. So it's not been a straight path. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Fun. I mean, I don't know. It sounds like you're, you're a child and it was like Jerry Garcia or something, you know, that I think when you grow up in Cincinnati, aren't you supposed to be like a product manager for Tide or something? Isn't it like, it's not very, <laughs> that's much more straightforward than your path. Yeah. Yeah. Only the very best and the brightest. I had to go further afield. So <laughs> And Jason, same same basic story for you, or yeah, not at all. Um, although I do, I have a somewhat windy path. So I grew up in California, um, so I uh, I tend to be fairly laid back on on most fronts. Um, maybe that's where that comes from. Uh, thought I wanted to be an engineer. Um, my dad's an engineer and said, "Don't do it." Uh, so did not want to be on the bench for the next 40 years. I I'm way too, uh, I don't know. Intellectually curious is the nice way to put it. You know, reality is I, I get bored easily. So, um, I couldn't do the same thing over and over again. So, uh, did my PhD in virology. So that was never really used up until maybe the COVID era where I actually understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, and, Everybody's uh, knocking on your door and saying, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. How does this work? And I'm like, well, uh, 20 years ago, I could have told you, um, so I've kind of had a winding path since then through uh, market research and market analytics for pharma, mostly. Um, always been on the new product side and, and, and innovation. Um, so I think, again, with my limited attention span, it's fun to do new things every six, six, six to 12 months. Um, but uh, yeah, arrived at, at DataVant through an acquisition three years ago. And uh, it's it's been a lot of fun and a lot of uh, a lot of new things that we're doing. So it has not not gotten boring at all. In fact, it's getting a little <laughs> a little more complicated every every year here. It's, it's good. You know, I was just thinking, Jason, as you were speaking about how you get bored easily and I was thinking in my head, say, let's acquire a huge company and uh, that'll make a, that'll, that'll keep Jason interested for a little while. So I, now I understand the strategic intent behind that one. So we'll, we'll, we'll just skip that question when we get to it. So, well, good. So listen, before we jump in and talk about kind of specifically your industry and, and where DataVan plays and drill down into that, you know, what is just the general state of healthcare data, you know, in this country? I think about you know, it's been 10 years, more than 10 years since the Affordable Care Act. High tech was before that. We've gone electronic. There's all sorts of personal data. There's all sorts of stuff out there. But I mean, how do you think about where we are with, with healthcare data kind of in general? Yeah, I can start that one. I think, you know, if you cast your mind back 20 years ago, healthcare data really mostly meant uh, for the pharma world, um, prescription data, right? Out of retail pharmacies, 
most of the world was just about tracking drugs and prescriptions. Um, the world got a little more complicated when people discovered, uh, you know, medical claims. And they said, oh, in addition to tracking prescriptions, I can now see what happened at the doctor's visit by looking at the medical claim. I start to understand different disease dynamics, referral patterns, uh, comorbidities. That's interesting stuff. Um, but a claim is only to get paid, right? So it doesn't have all the other clinical information. And so, you know, I think we've evolved from medical claims now to folks looking at clinical EHRs, right? The EHR has more lab values. It's got more, more depth to it. That gets interesting um, as we're starting to get more diagnostics. Now we see a lot more lab data. Uh, we go from, you know, kind of blood tests and things like that to now genetic biomarkers. And so what we're seeing is you, as you look at the state of healthcare data and, and how it's evolved is we've gone from a pretty narrow set of data with a fairly narrow set of use cases, right? Brand tracking, um, sales rep payments uh, from, from the retail pharmacy data to now we have a ton of different data that can really satisfy a lot of different use cases, right? And so we're starting to see more and more data being available, not just from the Affordable Care Act, but just from the, the rapid adoption of diagnostics, wearables, implanted devices that are spitting out real-time data from your pacemaker. Um, lots of interest now in social determinants data and how that uh, impacts health. Um, and so our view is that the, the world of data is rapidly expanding, right? It's more data than ever. It's rapidly fragmenting even more than it was, right? So data was always pretty fragmented. We, you know, you go to one doctor, they record your visit in the EHR, they refer you to a specialist. Now your data is in another EHR. You get hospitalized. It's another EHR. You get a lab test. It's another, you know, lab system. Um, but as we generate more data, it's not being generated in those same silos. It's now a new silo, right? And you start to think about clinical trials. That's another data silo. A patient support program, another silo. So our view is tons and tons of data is getting available. Um, there's more and more types of it to satisfy new use cases that you want to do but the complexity of working with it is actually expanding as well, right? We're not actually getting better at making that data available and useful um, because I think the problem is kind of outrunning us, you know, as much as we solve it's, you know, uh, the complexity is increasing faster. Yeah. So it's, it's not like a, like a library and you get a collection and then there's more books being published every year and just add some shelves and maybe you just, you know, you just fit it into the Dewey decimal system or, or, or whatever. It's not like that. No. No, if we were generating more of the same, I think that we could get we can get there. But we're, we're generating more of different data. Just just to jump in real quick, I think Jason gave us a lot of the texture of what's becoming available. If you just go very high level, you want every decision in healthcare to be informed by data, uh, and today it's not. Um, and if you look at what's happening in the market right now, to Jason's comments more data is coming online year over year than ever before in human history. There's more investment in health analytics and technology than ever before. And yet we're still living in this world where the vast majority of decisions that are made in healthcare are not informed by data. Uh, and I think one of the core questions we've thought about is why is that the case? and what would it take to change it? Um, I think your sort of library analogy is a great one. It's like, there are more books on the shelf, easy. Like, just add, add a new shelf. Of course, in reality, it's much more complicated. And the question is, how do you actually figure out where the data is? How do you access it? How do you connect it in a longitudinal way to make it useful for you to go and start answering the questions that exist in healthcare today? And that's actually where things get really interesting and really complicated really quickly and, and is where we spend uh, pretty much all of our time. You know, so to go back to the library analogy for a minute, when there's books, you know, the authors are writing books, they're meant to be read, and that's kind of the primary purpose. In healthcare, some of the things like that Jason was describing, like claims, you know, those were done to get paid. That, that, that was the purpose. And then it's just sort of like a byproduct that they're used for some other kind of uh, kind of analysis um, that's there. And so I, I see these some of these initial things are sort of as just byproducts, but then you talked about wearables and other sources that are actually much more directly about generating uh, data. And then the kind of a whole industry has grown up around the real world data, real world evidence, or just even more broadly um, than that around, around healthcare data. 
how do you think about what the structure is of the of the industry, however you want to define it? And then where does Datavant have its role? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I think um, the world I describe is mostly the world of data sources. So where this data is being generated. Um, that, if you want to think about it, is kind of the beginning of the data journey, right? That this data has been captured um, at a point of care. Um, there are a lot of things that happen to that data before it actually gets to use for an analytics purpose, right? And so um, there's a lot of places for, for somebody to play. And um, when we look at it, we think about, you know, the data has been generated. Um, before it leaves the covered entity or whoever that data owner is, there are a lot of compliance steps that have to happen to make it shareable without uh, impacting patient privacy, right? And so de-identification is, is a standard one. That's where Datavant plays is, is basically um, helping a data source uh, remove any of the identifying information about their patients so that whatever they share uh, to whoever they're gonna share it with, um, they're not risking patient privacy, right? So there's a, a de-identification step or a compliance step, right? If they're sharing identified data, they need a BAA and you might need patient consent Right. There's a lot of kind of compliance stuff that has to happen right away. Then that data starts to move downstream. Right. So through various players um, and there is there are steps where the data has to be cleaned. Um, it might need to be joined together with other data. Right. So if, if you want to study me and I have my data sitting at four different doctors because I see a primary care and three specialists. Right. All that all of my data has to get brought back together. Um, and so there's there's a linking and aggregation step that happens. Datamap provides this software to do that. But there are a number of players out there that are actually solely focused on aggregation, right? So they want to take a number of originating data sources, pull them together into a larger data set and, and basically assemble it and say, okay, now I've got a big data set and I've taken some of the work that somebody had to do to make this data set. I can now move that data downstream to an analytics vendor, right? So this is somebody who says, I, can, I know how to clean data for a specific use case. I know how to put dashboards or tools on top of it to kind of showcase insights. Um, and I've now made a kind of analytics ready, right? Or, and, and then the, the final person in that chain is, is the user, often a pharma company or a payer or a provider who's looking to answer a question, right? This is a business question they need to answer um, or a patient support pro question they need to answer. They're gonna be the user of those analytics tools to say, okay, how many diabetes patients were on my drug and what was their outcome? And how does that compare to other therapeutic options, right? Um, those are the, the players in this, this kind of chain of, of the data journey. Um, our view of Datavant is all of them have similar problems, right? They all need to find data. They all need to get it you know, compliantly. They all need to kind of link it together to, to build these, these assets. Datavant wants to basically be that middleware layer that sits between uh, some of these folks to help them do that, that, that data movement. Um, so Datavant's role is, as we've carved it out, just doing the data connectivity, right? So we're gonna help data be made compliant for leaving the source and arriving at a destination, right? That's all we do. We don't, the data, the data is not ours, we're not selling it, we're not creating it, and we're not doing any of the analytics or aggregation or other things, right? We're simply gonna sit in this little lane, but that's a very important lane. If we do that job well, and we can make a lot of that data available to all the people who want to use it, then the use cases everybody's trying to power have a lot more data flowing in. It's a lot more representative data, right? I think we've seen a lot of issues with data being biased uh, based on where it's collected. Um, and that basically the end result, people trying to answer questions, they're gonna get a better answer, right? And patients will get better care because the data had higher integrity, it was more representative, uh, less biased, and uh, you know everybody wins. So that's, I think, where we see the, the world of players. And you know, you mentioned all these different uh, different pieces, and and Datavant has a, maybe a narrow but an important lane there, like the median, so the cars don't crash into each other, right? So I like these analogies. But yeah. what are you seeing in terms of you know vertical integration or across those pieces? You know, like are those all separate players? You know, generate the data, clean it, aggregate it, analyze it, and is that is that changing? You know, is it used to be that more you'd kind of get all your your data and then you offer that all on top or is it, you know, how, how is that evolving? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I think back when the world was simpler and people were looking at just a couple data types, um, it was a good uh, business model based to say, I'm gonna know everything there is to know about retail pharmacy and I'm gonna build a fully, you know, vertically integrated stack, 
right? Where I have raw data, I'm cleaning it, I'm assembling it, I'm putting analytics on top, and I'm putting a whole set of consulting services on top of that, right? And I can give you the whole stack. Yeah. Icubia, Symphony, there have been great businesses built on that, on that vision. Our view is with the explosion of data, it's really getting fairly impossible to say, I'm gonna be full stack across everything that there, there is out there in terms of data and all possible use cases. That's just not possible anymore. And so our view is you're actually gonna see still some vertically integrated folks, but they're gonna be much more defined around a certain disease type, right? So there might be cancer analytics companies and certain use cases, right? I'm, I'm cancer, but I'm doing clinical development, right? So I'm gonna do trial feasibility and recruiting and all sorts of stuff, but somebody else might be doing cancer and commercial uh, applications. And so I think we're going to see still vertical, but within much more of a niche kind of uh, play. Good. All right. Sounds good. So like, it's all sounds very simple and very neat and clean and just growing. So then as I alluded to before, the Psyox merger. Now, now Psyox, when I hear Psyox, it reminds me of, uh, you know, that discredited COX-2 inhibitor from some years back. So I assume that this is a different group. It's not like another Me Too drug in the COX-2 class. <laughs> Is that right? I mean, what, what, what is all, I mean, what is Psyox and what, you know, what, what is the merger all about and why? Yeah. So I'll, I'll try and take that one piece by piece a little bit. Um, so Psyox's core of business is uh, retrieving medical records. Um, and people need to do this for all sorts of reasons. You have release of information requests. Uh, you have patients trying to access their data through a patient portal and somebody needs to go and actually pull the records on the back end. You have lawyers bringing malpractice suits who need to go and pull medical records in connection with the suit. Uh, you have large insurance companies that are doing risk adjustment analysis under Medicare uh, to try and figure out how many chronically ill patients they're taking care of. That all requires access to medical records. Um, and when you get into it, the plumbing for how all that works is sort of fantastically complicated. Uh, and Cyox is basically better than anyone else in the industry at going and pulling those records wherever they exist, if it's a health system or a hospital or a clinic. Um, and uh, th thinking about the merger and why it made sense to come together, uh, as we think about Datavant, what we're trying to build is uh, an ecosystem of companies that can work well together, seamlessly exchange data to solve a bunch of different problems in healthcare. And that ecosystem to be successful over time needs to be ubiquitous. You wanna be working with every data source out there and every data user out there. Uh, you need to be trusted by all of the parties. Um, so to Jason's comments, you need to understand the ins and outs of what is required from a compliance perspective to exchange data. How do you protect patient privacy when data is exchanged and connected? Uh, and you need to be neutral. And so, you know, when we're talking about staying in our lane and solving the connectivity problem, it's important that we don't veer all over and say, oh, we're gonna do analytics over here. We're gonna sell data over here. Um, because when you start to do that, uh, you start to compete with some of your best customers and partners who are already exceptional at doing that. And so you should just enable their businesses. The question is, how can you grow that ecosystem as quickly as possible to become ubiquitous? And who out there is trusted and who out there is neutral? And that quickly becomes a pretty short list of organizations. And what Cyax has is an enormous footprint and trusted relationships with provider organizations across the country where they are, you know, uh, securely fulfilling medical record requests every single day. And they're also a neutral player. They're not trying to go into the business of selling data. They're not trying to go out there and do analytics. And so our business models were very, very closely aligned. Um, and coming together, we think will be a massive accelerant for, for both companies. Now, does Cyox, I mean, you said the businesses are, are pretty aligned in terms of the business model. Does their business need to, to change? Because I don't know where they wouldn't, they wouldn't have described exactly what you, know, what you were doing before. Is it basically just adding the capacity to handle identifiable, identified information to the de-identified side? Or 
you know, do they have to sort of sh shuck off some of their other business or, you know, stop doing some of that, some of what they're already doing today? So, so their core business of record retrieval is, is very, very closely aligned. And today, if you look out across the market and you think about data connectivity problems, um, there's sort of two worlds that exist almost completely independently of each other. <laughs> One is the world of de-identified connectivity, which is where a data event has always played. And if you're trying to do large scale population health analytics, uh, anything being done at a pharmaceutical company on a patient population, that's all de-identified data. And so one of the core problems there is how do you connect de-identified data um, while preserving patient privacy, which is what data event is, is best in the world at. There's this whole other world out there of connectivity problems, which are all identified problems. And so when you think about, you know, EHR to EHR data connectivity for care coordination, uh, when you think about a large insurance company that needs to pull records from providers for value-based care arrangements, um, those, those are all identified flows and is a kind of different category of company. But when you go down a level, it's all the same organizations. It's all the same data. It's all permutations on the same flows. It's just one's an identified flow, one's a de-identified flow, one requires a real-time API, one requires batch processing. Um, and so uh, for DataVent plus Sciox, sort of the, the go forward vision is for any organization in the healthcare system, that needs to securely and compliantly exchange data, uh, you can fulfill their needs. Um, and so all data that might be coming into your organization to better understand your patient population, all data that you might wanna share to go enable a registry to be created here, to go enable this analytics company to facilitate patient finding here, that, that you can do that through, through one organization. And so, you know, there's, uh, there's never a magic wand in these scenarios. That's, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, but the, the goal is to bring those capabilities together across both organizations in the most seamless way possible. So you've got the, um, the identified information on the one side, the de-identified on the other. And it sounds like, you know, same organizations, generally speaking, but maybe some reasonably different technical challenges to do. Uh, to do it? Or, you know, is it something DataVent could have just like gotten into the identified side or it's really just, there's a, quite a few things that are different. I mean, anything over time can be, can be done. That's, that's one question. And then the other question is with the, you know, the use cases are separate now. You've got kind of one world of de-identified as you described and one world of identified. Do those converge or are there even hybrid use cases that actually require both identified and, and de-identified, or if we think about it, like in the life cycle of a, of a project, you know, so there's like kind of the technical question, they're different. And then do they come together or is it just like adding something completely to the side? You want to start Jason? Uh, I'll start, yeah. um, but there's, there's a lot of, a lot of answers to these questions. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so Bob, Bob answered the easy question and now he feels like, you know, he's done his part now. And now we'll see if Jason has anything intelligent to say. Well, since, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still, to be, still to be determined. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll keep trying to one-up each other here. Um, yeah. So uh, on the technical side, um, there are a, a number of companies pursuing kind of identified record retrieval. Um, and they're doing it in different ways. Um, the technology at scale is really hard, right? So a lot of folks can re yeah. retrieve the record. That's, that's not that complicated. With the ONC ruling and fire, um, it's getting a little easier to extract data um, from from EHRs from from certain sites. Um, Sciox does it the hard way, which is um, they don't they don't they're not satisfied with just getting the the fire data elements. If you think about all the things that are in an EHR, um, fire standards only cover half of it, right? And so, uh, if you actually want the full chart just pulling out of the fire API is not good enough. So what yeah. Sciox is doing is they're actually sitting behind the, the scenes, they're double badged in at these hospitals and clinics and things. Um, and they're actually working through not just the HR, but they'll go down to the basement and find the microfiche and, and find your images and all sorts of things and actually put them together into a large electronic, you know, uh, chart to send back to whoever was requesting it. 
that at scale is not just a technology problem, but it's a people problem. Um, and there's a whole lot of compliance that goes in. I think that's, that shouldn't be understated. It's not just a technology thing, but every uh, health system has their own uh, basically information management policies that need to be followed and certain things that they'll disclose for certain use cases, right? So if a lawyer requests a, a chart for a certain purpose or a payer requests it for value-based care or a patient or doctor requests it for care coordination, they actually want to disclose different amounts of the chart. And so you have to understand each institution what data should be pulled and 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 sent on because it's different everywhere. Um, SIAX has spent a long time and has embedded all these institutions to figure those things out. And so could Datavan have gone in and done it? We could have done it at a simplistic level, um, but we would never have been able to actually access the full amount of data that folks need. And it would have been a real, real project to figure all the compliance rules out. And I think that's one of the big unappreciated barriers to entry in this market is it's it's hard, right? There's, there's a lot of nuance there. Bob, I'll let you chime in on that before we kind of go to question two. Anything to add there? Yeah, and I have a follow-up question on that one. I have a follow-up question on that one too before I let you go to the second one, so. The, the only thing that I would add there is, I think, say for Fire APIs, first Fire is great. <laughs> We're champions of Fire. The more data that flows, the better. Um, one thing that we've come to learn over the year, having an API and hooking it up. And um, part of what you need is also just those trusted relationships with the different provider organizations. Um, and so there's the issue of what can be passed through the fire standard. There's all sorts of technical complexity for what needs to be disclosed for a particular use case. But then there's also just the very practical element of how do you go and build a trusted relationship with literally tens of thousands of health systems and hospitals and clinics and government agencies. And uh, that, that takes time uh, and has taken the SIAX business many, many years to get to that point. Um, and I think for many of the companies springing up now that have great technology um, and strong APIs, there's also the challenge of uh, you know, how do you allow those provider organizations to plug into it effectively and, and earn their trust? So, so my follow-up question was on just understanding how where SIAX is positioned. You're talking about a lot of players that do this. So would you put them in the same category as like, I, I think of them as like MRO would be another one that might, might be in that category. And then there's like some newfangled ones like Moxie. Is that, how would you distinguish SIAX from, from companies like that? I think MRO is pretty similar. So I think that's a good anal yeah. analog for, for Ciox. Um There are companies out there, uh, Health Gorilla, um, OneUp, other folks that are really focused on uh, pulling charts uh, through APIs. I think to Bob's point, great technology, uh, certain use cases, the fire standard will satisfy quite well. Um, but because you have an API, doesn't mean that the health system wants you plugging in and extracting data, right? There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of compliance risk to them to let data flow out and they want to know exactly who it's flowing out to. And they are very disincentivized yeah. to let more than one or two people be portals of the data out. Um, and so yeah. building the API to Bob's point is the easy part, getting people to let you install it and flow data through it is the hard part. Um, yeah. You know, we'll see how the ONC ruling might change that a little bit. You know, I think the, the health systems don't want to be accused of data blocking, um, but, uh, I guess you know. they'd rather be accused. They'd rather be accused of that than 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 to share their prices for things. Though I guess well, or, or or have a whole bunch of HIPAA breaches where unauthorized data was flowing out of their <laughs> right. So um, fair uh, enough. Sox is is actually you know to Bob's point the, the trusted partner for data to flow out. And I, I think that um, what some health systems have, have basically done is say my data flows out through Sox. If you want to get data, go talk to Sox. Right, and they're they're my gatekeeper. Yeah. Um, and, and they'll, 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 they'll be the ones that are the arbiters of, of data moving, um, which is a nice position for a health system to kind of be able to take because they, they can basically say, yeah, my data is available. So I'm not information blocking, but I'm not the one actually trying to police this thing. All right. Now I'm ready for the second uh, part of the question. I'm excited to hear about as much as it's exciting about, uh, you know, dealing with the, uh, the basements of, uh, health systems and what they allow and don't for the lawyers to do versus the, uh, 
you know, versus the coordination of benefits people and all that. What about these use cases? Identified, de-identified? Are they evolving? Are they coming together? I think they're evolving. Um, you know, I think as you think about de-identified data, that's great for anything that's at a cohort level or a population level. Right? I don't need to know who an individual person is, so we can de-identify the whole data set. Um, I learn a lot of things. I can build models. Um, that's that's super useful. Uh, where it starts to be a little less useful is when I say I now want to do something with that data for specific patients. Right? I need to take it. It looks like patients who look like this are at risk of a stroke. Okay. Well, now I want to contact those people and have them see their doctor and get a get a test, right? Or be on a blood thinner or whatever they need to do. De-identified data stops there, right? Because we can't re-identify those individuals. Um, so there's always this need to kind of apply what you've learned to the identified data. Um, and so I think that's one of the things we like about the SIAX uh, model is that we now have the ability to kind of, okay, when you do that transition, we, we can help you access identified data. There are, there are some places that sit there in that middle, right? So I think your question was, yes, there's de-identified, yes, there's identified, what about both? Um, I think as we think yeah. about clinical trials, um, patient support programs, uh, registries, those are things that can exist in a de-identified slash identified state where a patient is given consent, right? Um, I know who they are because they're enrolled in my trial, or enrolled in my registry, but when the data is actually collected, it's in a limited data set or, or de-identified, um, you know, uh, format, but I can still go grab more identified data about them. Right? I know that this is Jason. He's in my, my registry. Um, he's given me permission to go get his full medical record. So I can see the last 10 years of everything that happened to him and I can pull that into the registry. That's the bridge that is really interesting now is to say, I might, you know, I'm enrolling Jason. When I collect his data, I'm going to keep it de-identified, but because I have his consent, I can actually go get more identified data about him, de-identify and, and bring it in also. Um, and so I think there's, there's that meld of, of this world of, we used to do things kind of the hard way of, of single patient at a time, clinical visits to gather that information. Um, now if we can get consent, we can actually do the chart pull and pull in a whole tranche of data about the person, uh, from the real world rather than a, a doctor having to do a giant intake process. That's great. Now, when you get into that sort of a model where you're moving the identified data like that, how different is that from a health information exchange? Would they be a competitor in that sense? Or is it is it is like different use cases or different uh, capabilities? Um, I think there's there's some HIEs that are doing great right now. Um, it's not a model that worked out at, you know, at a national scale, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the data issues are, are a big part of that. So I think the, the HIEs that are running are doing well, fantastic. Um, they can access more information about their patients, right? So if they're getting care outside the HIE, um, if there's social determinants data that they want to understand, um, we're happy to support them by bringing more data into their HIE environment and say, I can get a, a more complete picture of my patients and serve them better. Um, where there isn't an HIE, we would love to be basically the the infrastructure upon which an HI could be built much more easily, right? So if we're if we're working with the underlying providers, and and their data can be uh, flows through the SIOX pipes or the data management software, um, and you want to form an HIE, maybe we've solved eighty percent of accessing the data you need. Yeah. Right. So I think that's a that's a great position for us to be in. Is you know we're not an HIE, we're not going to compete with an HIE, but maybe we make it a lot easier for them to exist. And, and we'd be very happy with that. Yeah, because they've never been able to figure out a real business model. But if you've got a going concern and you're already doing eight percent of the the work, then maybe it's a more natural, you know, kind of an add-on for that functionality, and you'll be yeah. around. You know, There's plenty of work tomorrow. to go around. So right, we're doing this much of it. There are a whole bunch of you know yeah. structured data warehousing companies that can come along and do all the rest of it, and then the HIE can sit on top of that. Um, it's it's got a it. very very fertile landscape to build lots of different businesses of which we, we were only solving a small part. Yeah. So how, how's the pandemic going for you? Uh, the home office is working great. Um, I think the yeah. pandemic was really informative about the limitations of health data in the United States, especially. Um, you know, we don't yeah. have we don't have a nationalized healthcare system, which means we don't have nationalized data. And so, uh, you know, last March when when things were really getting serious, uh, it was really clear that the federal agencies, public health officials, uh, commercial entities did not have a good picture of what was going on, right? And that's in large part because of this fragmentation issue we've been talking about. 
the data is all there, but it's in a hundred different places. Um, yeah. And so I think the pandemic really, you know, uh, brought that out in, that out in bold face that this is a problem. Um, we stood up the, the COVID-19 research database uh, in April last year, which with our partners um, contributing a bunch of technology, a bunch of data, um, a bunch of services um, has really been a boon for kind of nonprofit research on COVID. And, and so, you know, the, the nice thing about being part of this ecosystem is, is we know all the people that have data. We know the people that have the services and technology to bring it to life. Um, there were a lot of generous folks out there who, who wanted to do something and contributed what they had. Um, and that the COVID research database now has, uh, you know, hundreds of projects running in it. Um, we, we have a fantastic scientific steering committee that is approving projects and making sure that they're, they're good and well thought out, but doing it in a two week process, right? This is not a month's long, uh, grant application. This is, this is basically instantaneous and onboarding. Um, the Gates foundation was generous enough to give us, uh, basically a, a pile of grant money. Uh, for those researchers to facilitate them doing that research. Um, so it's really been a tremendous, I think, boon for the real world data part of the industry to say, hey, look, here's what we can do, right? Look at all this data that is actually out there. If we can put it together quickly and make it accessible and remove some of these barriers for researchers, we can actually get a lot of insight really quickly. Um, and I think that's been, you know, one of the silver linings of this whole pandemic is um, it's forced people to kind of confront some of these problems and look at, at solving them a new way. You know, uh, during the pandemic, of course, you've, you've announced this uh, this big merger with Ciox and the, the company I think of as the most uh, direct competitor for data event, uh, Health Verity. You know, they just had a, a very big um, fundraising round that was coming mm -hmm. up. Are you taking the same path and or are you sort of diverging in, so, in some ways? How do you how do you see that playing out? Um... You know, first off, I don't, I don't, we don't think of health Verity as a competitor. I think that they're a, a valuable member of the ecosystem. We're all solving slightly different problems in the real world data space. Um, we, we think they do a fantastic job of what they do. Um, but I think the interest in them is well deserved. Um, but I think it's indicative of, of really the whole sector, right? I think there is a lot of money flowing in as people start to realize that you know, real world data um, is not only a, a viable area for business, but really is where a lot of the innovation is coming from and where a lot of disruption is actually happening. So I think, you know, if you think about clinical trials um, have been done basically the same way for the last 40 years. Uh, again, with the pandemic, people couldn't run trials the same way. They've turned to decentralized clinical trials where, you know, patients are, are reporting their own outcomes. We're doing a lot of things virtually. Um, real world data is a really important piece of that puzzle to solve it because now I can verify a patient's eligibility by pulling their real world data, right? Do they actually fit the inclusion and exclusion criteria if I couldn't get a doctor to see them? Um, I can monitor that patient using real world data instead of them come in for site visits, right? So the pandemic has forced us to kind of look at real world data as a way to kind of do things differently. And in so doing, those trials are faster, cheaper, bigger sample sizes, um, lots of advantages. They have a lot fewer biases because I can now recruit patients from anywhere. Um, you know, in theory. Uh, and so I can start to get disadvantaged populations and other folks that have traditionally been excluded from trials. I think people see that as, wow, we can disrupt billion, billions of dollars of, of kind of the way it was done through real world data, through these companies. Um, and as I said, there's, there's lots of room for lots of players in this chain of, of data. And I think there's, there's going to be a lot of investment in players across that whole spectrum. So Health Verity is doing really well. I think you can see that same high valuations and, and uh, reward for, for a lot of companies in the space. Um, as for our path, right. I don't think we have a charted one. I think we were, we're opportunistic. Yeah. A little. So we'll see. Bob, on the, uh, you know, and your role as the chief operating officer, you, know, you think about operations is one of the hard things to deal with uh, during a, a pandemic. How, how has that worked to be, you know, building a, a big business and trying to have an operating model, you know, now we're approaching, you know, a year and a half, approaching two years at, um, at some point in the pandemic mode? What, what, how have, you, have, your, uh, how have things shifted for you? Two, two, two things I've been thinking about recently. One is the COVID-19 research database that Jason mentioned, uh, we were standing that up pretty shortly after we went remote. And so we were navigating all the questions of 
how are we going to work together in a remote environment? What can we do over Zoom? Will we be as productive? Uh, Jason and I spent many like 80, 90 hour weeks sort of barreling through that project, which involved coordinating with tons of different partners and stakeholders. And uh, if you had told me, you know, a few months before the pandemic hit that we were going to have to pull this off with this big yeah. and a diverse group in record time, I would have been like, no, that, that doesn't seem very likely. Uh, but one of the biggest surprises for us has been how the flip to remote has been pretty seamless um, and uh, has, has allowed us to be extremely productive through that period. Um, the other thing I've been thinking about is uh, in the merger with Cyox, we, we did the whole thing remotely, which a couple of years ago would have been crazy to think about. Uh, back in my days of being a lawyer, there's always a point in the deal where everybody flies to the same conference room yeah. and down there and bangs out all the details until you're done. And, uh, and, and we were able to bring these companies together without meeting in person, um, which is kind of a crazy fact. So I, I think we've been able to be extremely productive and it's been a great time for the business. I do think on a longer time horizon, there are all sorts of challenges to figure out of when your company is growing dramatically year over year. It's one thing for me and Jason who know each other really well and have spent a lot of time sitting in the same room before this all happened to carry that over into a remote world. When you join a company remotely, can you build the same relationships? Can you have the same experience? Can you get plugged in in the same way? Everything we've seen so far makes us uh, optimistic about that going forward, but of course, continued challenges and, and things that we're thinking about. Yeah, we'll have to we'll 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 have this recorded for posterity, and we'll check back in a year and see how that's going. Yeah, and some of the same, you know, some of the same issues companies have managed to yep. do it to this point. But a lot of stress is under the surface, and we'll see what you know new things can be can be invented. Now, Jason, I know you said that even it's a bit opportunistic, but if you look at the overall kind of vision for not even just for data Vant, but if you look at the industry evolution, you know, look ahead. You, you kind of look back twenty years. Look ahead five years. You know, what, how are things going to evolve? What will the kind of ecosystem look like five years from now? I mean, our, our goal is to connect the world's health data and improve patient outcomes, right? And so uh, we measure ourselves almost exclusively on, on the size of the ecosystem that, that we work with, right? So that's kind of the, both the people who have data and the, both the, the people who use data. And again, as a middleware player, the more we can kind of bring people together um, the more successful we, we view ourselves. So there is a, a, a five-year plan of essentially we would love to be installed in every health, health system, uh, in every source of data out there. Um, and we'd love to be powering, you know, all the people who are using health data for whatever use case they're doing. Um, will we get there in five years and be 100%? Uh, that's, that's a big challenge, especially as you remember yeah. back when we were saying there's more and more data every day of all different types. Yeah. Can we, can we even keep up? I'm not sure. Um, so I think that's kind of our, our grand vision, but there's there's a lot of little frictions in there that we would like to take out as well, right? So if, if, if party A wants to work with party B, there's a bunch of compliance things that we've talked about. There's a bunch of just moving data uh, and the mechanics of that. There's, there's a kind of contracting piece that, that people have to solve. Um, so we continuously think about not only growing our ecosystem, but what are the little frictions that we can take out of that process to make it easier and easier for people to do a data exchange with each other, right? Ideally, at the end of the day, it's, I want to work with you, you want to work with me, great, go, right? Um, but there's a hundred things that have to happen in that, you know, pressing the go button right now. Can we reduce that to 50 or 20 um, and standardize them and yeah. everybody kind of agrees on the rules of the road? That's the kind of stuff that's really tricky and hard. Um, we'd love to get to the point where we've identified a lot of those frictions. Um, we can take out some of them. Our partners and ecosystem players can help take out some of those frictions. Um, and, and together we've kind of solved it so that A and B can work together without a whole lot of fuss. And I think that, that would be our, our desired end state. Great, well, thanks for indulging me with uh, answers to all these difficult questions. So I'll ask you sort of a fun question to, to end things up. And, and that's whether you have any books that you recommend uh, to read or, or in fact, any that you recommend that people avoid that you wasted your time on. <laughs> Um, 
I just finished up uh, Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Um, it's fiction, so I'm, I'm recommending things to entertain you and, and keep your life uh, fun during this period. Um, Andy Weir wrote The Martian. You guys have probably seen the movie. Um, I like science fiction that has kind of actual real science in it. So, uh, you know, I think this was this is one of those books that it was a good story, but also lots of good science kind of embedded in the plot line. So uh, for my background, I, I found that very enjoyable. So if you're if you're a little bit of a science nerd, um, that's a great book. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite books that I go back to from time to time is uh, Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner. Um, which has nothing to do with healthcare or health data or business, uh, but, but it's about uh, the history of water rights in the West um, and all the dams that were built um, and all the sort of tussles between uh, the country and the cities for who has rights to water. Um, and uh, so, sort of fascinating history that obviously is still very relevant today. Well, boys, your lighthearted stuff is pretty hardcore, if I may say so. <laughs> yeah. I was I thinking of like comic books like that. or something like that. That sounds both, that sound both very good. Well, in any case, uh, Bob Borek, Chief Operating Officer, and Jason Labonte, Chief Strategy Officer of DataVant, thank you very much for your participation today on the Health Biz Podcast. Our pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, David. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.